at any rate, it's an honor to be here with you all today. Uh, I, I really mean that in the, in the most um, sincere way. And so I'd like to share some uh, information of work that we've been able to do um, at, at my lab with uh, federal surplus um, instrumentation that, that we've gotten through the NRCS from the Lincoln Laboratory. And uh, uh, Wade Bott is, was hugely important in terms of getting that, um, that uh, $25,000 equipment to us for free. We just had to drive to Lincoln. So at any rate, I'm going to share some information with you all today on, on soil micromorphology. And I have to say it's a, it's a bit of a, um, uh, it's sort of an esoteric field of, of pedology. And so I'm going to, I'm going to um, uh, shout out to Dr. Banerjee because I wanted to make sure I said to you all that there's two words I'll use a lot in this, in this in the, and one is edaphic properties, edaphic soil properties, which of course was in his slide right in the first second or second slide. And of course those are the, the Greek root is edaphos, the base foundation, and clearly that's part of what you all are about in your management schemes for sure. And the other is pedology, and that's my field. I started soil mapping in eastern Montana, and then got to come to the experiment station after a couple years. So um, it, it's been great, and I've been in North Dakota ever since. So we have these two vastly different sort of uh, terms uh, uh, that we think about. So at any rate, I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to, let's see here. One, I'm going to make sure I can work this silly thing. Um, so. I want to set the stage a little bit before I just share a, a sort of a general idea of what we'll look at. Um, okay, so so uh, let's set, let's set the stage in this sense. This uh, this soybean farmer um, undoubtedly uh, did some contracting with a fertilizer group uh, before he before he planted in in Western Cass County, and um, and so. You know, he contracted with a company, they did some composite sampling, um, they did some testing, and they got a table back of nitrogen, phosphorus, maybe a few micronutrients. Well, that all came from this bag, right? That maybe was a composted uh, comp uh, composition of several diverse sites across the field. And this is nothing new, and I don't mean it in any, in any bad sense, but really, in a sense, it's a bit of a reductionist approach, which is a 13-cent word for describing very complex phenomenon with the most simple parts. And so, in the old days, when pedology got away from geology, um, the geologists had this black box, and all they thought about was how much available potassium or nitrogen was in a soil. Uh, and uh, you all know that that's not the case. You all have tacit knowledge about your land. You know, you know this intimately, and I want to I want to share that with you. But it's still at the same point in time. I want to ask this question: mentally, especially societally, okay? Um, how do we move mentally beyond the tractor, the combine, the Giddings probe, you know, and the thousand count kernel weight, okay, which is important. Certainly, but how do we move to a better appreciation of that complex phenomenon on that soil? And that's what I want to share with you today as much as possible. Um, so we're going to take a look at another method of, if you will, appreciation of soil. And I'm thinking about what Dr. Lal said about that idea of societal values. He had three things he put up on the board yesterday, and the first was societal and had aesthetic. It had religious, remember? Uh, and, and I wrote that down. I thought that was well said, um, certainly. So this is hot off the lab bench. What are we talking about? We're talking about soil thin sections. And this just came off our lab bench last week, thanks to Matt's work. Um, we've been out of resin for like two years because of pandemic problems, and so we weren't able to like work on some of the slabs that we had made earlier. So we've just finally got this. This is from up in Rolette County, and um, this is my first charcoal. Now you go, okay, well that's the thing that looks like the black girdle right there. Okay, but if you look carefully, there's a lot of gold material. This might be a pointer. I'm not going to, I'm just going to point, you know, because the, the, the picture's too stinking small with the pointer. Notice all the gold colors on the bottom of this, okay? Well, the colors aren't quite so gold up here above the red line. That's actually a worm, that's a worm channel. This is a, you're looking at a horizontal image here, okay? So this is just like taken out at some specific depth. I can't quite read it. It's taken at a 30 centimeter depth. So it's one foot below the soil. It's a horizontal slice, and this zone is, is actually a worm channel. So I don't know whether Charlie the worm actually dragged that charcoal with, or if it, we just are close to it. So here's what it looks like a little closer up. This is exciting because it's the first stinking chunk of charcoal I've gotten in one of my thin sections, and we've made hundreds of them. 
What's the big deal? It's, charcoal's used a lot in archaeology. It's used a lot in terms of paleoecological studies. People that are experts in it can actually identify various genera of plant, um, of plant materials. So it's pretty cool to finally get it, and it's fresh off the benches um, from, from us. So this was our, uh, so here's where we're going to go. But I'll start with showing you the first thin section we ever made in the lab. And this is Sukhwinder Bali's thin section. Uh, my friend Tom DeSutter went over to the stinking microscope, put his cell phone out, and took a picture down through the tube, through the eye tube. And this is what you're looking at. Okay? And so there's foreshadowing here because there's biota in there. Okay? Um, so we'll talk about micromorphology as a subdiscipline. Um, I'm going to share with you maybe a little bit long some of the lab methods so you can understand it's, you know, I mean, I have to admit, I have to ask you, probably not too many of you are aware of, even of the word micromorphology. Um, and then I'm going to share with you information about the Barnes Soil Series, which I've been working on for a long time. We'll use image analysis examples when we can, and then I'll follow up with some educational applications. And basically, it's the whole thing is a hook to soil appreciation. Right? Because, you know, we heard the other day that there were 2% of farmers in the country. Well, when I was in college in 75, they said there was 2% farmers in the country. So it's like you all know how few people there are actually growing the food that we all, that we all need. So <clears throat> this is where I started in the world, uh, in mapping soils. You know, we, we, we look at soil profiles. We think about drawing lines on aerial photographs. We think about the topo sequence in the landscape and how water moves and how the soils are formed. That's what we do as pedologists. We think about soil genesis, soil development, and then the distribution of those soils on the landscape. And there were some interesting patterns in Dr. Banerjee's um, images of where those, um, where those taxa were, uh, were highlighted and, and more dominant. Well, that was the beginning of it, and so I just want to sort of share this with you, because this is the way God works. I don't know what happened. I've always, I've always used a hand lens. Well, I got into this end of it, okay? I got into the soil micromorphology end of it, and so we're dealing, with, we're dealing with aggregates, and we're dealing with the minerals that are actually present in the soil and the mineral structures themselves. And so, uh, so I get to the age of, I don't know, 60 or something, and I'm going to learn a new discipline. I don't know any of the language. I'm going to deal with microscopes and hell's bells. My eyes are going. Like, that was a good move, but at any rate, let's see what happens. Uh, so this is what it is. It's the study of soil thin sections that are assembled in situ. We take them, just pretend half, the, half, the, half this, uh, this we just call a natural aggregate of pad, of course, and we, we sit this thing in a, in a silicone tray, just like you might make candy in, and we put resin in it, and I'll show you some images of that, and then we cut that with a tile saw. We polish it to the, uh, we polish it to the thickness of a silt grain. So if it's a good thin section, it's half the thickness of your hair. And that's none of you with Italian or Armenian heritage, okay? That's, you know, thinner hair. Uh, so uh, it's really, really small when it's perfect. Um, and we do this to understand soil components, their arrangement, and their function. Kubiena was the father. He was an Austrian, uh, and he coined the term undisturbedness. And think about that. That's the whole concept of undisturbedness. And think of that soil bag that we talked about that was crushed and pulverized to get that soil, to get that table of soil uh, nutrients in that soybean field. So it's really the idea of soil architecture. And it, from a sort of a subdisciplinary point of view, I got to go to this this last summer in St. Louis, or uh, forgive me, in November at our annual meetings. It was a full day workshop, and it was the first in 25 years. And notice what they called it. So it's a nice time to actually be generating thin sections from our region, this incredibly important state agriculturally. Um, uh, and it was full. They had to turn people away at the workshop. So how do we do it? Um, we, we do it, I don't know when I started. So uh, Seth, if you're here, you're going to have to jump up and down. Lab methods. We start with this pad, which I just sort of said was half this, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, technical unit. So that's a real pad from a forest soil. We have to go from that pad into a resin impregnated block at about 60 degrees in a vacuum oven that helps pull the material up. Water content is very carefully adjusted before we do all of that kind of thing. And then we, and then we take that block, which we believe is undisturbed, 
and uh, following his idea. Uh, and then we t take it to a tile saw, we make a slab, and then we glue that with that resin, which has been unavailable for two years, to a petrographic glass slide. Then we polish that slide, and here you can see one right here from the Snellman, um, and that's what a thin section looks like. If, if, it's, if it's really good when you rub your hand across the glass slide, you can't even feel the soil layer. You can't even feel it. Sometimes Anne would bring one to me and she said, I just got one, and I'd say, I can't see anything. I can't see anything. It's there, you just have to look with a microscope to kind of get at it, it's really cool. So this was one of, of Mackenzie's first thin sections. This is what it, uh, uh, and you can see the glass plate there, um, 27 by 47, and this one was wonderful because we had just such continuity. Sometimes you don't get anywhere near that much. So steps to taking a good thin section, you slice, you polish, you clean, you sonicate, you get the grit off of it, etching and inspection in the soils laboratory. Okay, and then from that, I'm going to be sharing with you some images here today. There's three sources. These are the very, the very literal microscopes that these images were taken from. Dr. Lydia Tackett from Geosciences was, um, used her startup money, part of it, to buy this beautiful Zeiss, and she, she let me use that because um, we got together in 2015 together, and so she was interested in this work. Uh, then I got one about two years later, or something like that. I got my own used Zeiss in my lab, and so that sits in my lab right now. That's what we use. And then after we observe it in the lab, we take it to this histology scanner. And that's the MOTIC scanner is what it's called um, in the AIM lab, which is the, the advanced imaging and microscopy lab run by this wizard, Dr. Borowitz. It's really amazing. Um, the guy builds microscopes for fun. Um, but this is a tomograph. This is a tomograph that's in their histology lab. And they take tissues and they, um, they secure them in wax, and then they slice them on the tomograph. They slice them, the Latin for tomo is slice, and they slice them to a five micron thickness. And they come, off the t they come off of it like sliced bread at a bakery, and they're five stinking microns thick, okay? Five millionths of a meter in terms of thickness. Well, what we're doing in the soils laboratory is we're scanning a gravel road. Okay, because our soil patterns are nothing like something as, as perfect as a tomograph. So we have to polish, we have to do what we can to try to make that as, as smooth as possible so that it's, uh, it, it, we can use it in our, in our um, um, microscopic uh, uh, observations and analysis. So, okay, here. So let's, let's think. So this is what a modic scan looks like. And I want to share this with you. So in the, this is free software. And uh, up in the upper corner, you can see the whole slide. And the little area that we're concentrating on is that green box. If you can see it well enough, there's a little uh, focal point in the, in the green box. So here we can see the scale is it's 200 microns shown there. And the, the blue box is one, one uh, pixel as taken by the modic machine. And when you stick your slide in it, the machine, if it's, if it's a histology slide, it goes zoom. And when I stick mine in, it goes clunk, clunk, clunk. <laughs> You know, it's just, it's bizarre, but sometimes we can get these amazing images. And so we get these out of focus zones sometimes. It's, you know, you want, you want to pull your hair out. Uh, but sometimes things can pop out from those out of focus zones. So there's something to learn in a thin section, even if it's a tiny little piece of that full petrographic slide. And so here's an example of one. So I, I, we're, I'm, in the, I'm in the lab and I'm looking at this and I'm going, what in the world is this? And Dr. Kimberly Zitnick, who was, is, was in the pictures of Dr. Sam, Sam's um, team out in the field, she had the money ears in one of the other pictures, she identified this, she said, whoa, she said, this is Mortiarella. I said, what? She identified the genera of the tip of the hyphal structure from the out-of-focus zone. From the out-of-focus zone, she identifies it might as well be a Greek, a Greek spear or a Roman spear or an Armenian spear. She identified the genera of Mortiarella, which is I totally blow my mind. So sometimes we can see some really cool stuff, even if it doesn't seem like it's um, uh, going to be helpful. This is uh, then I followed up and, you know, this is being used in Europe. It's being examined in Europe as a, as a soil health indicator. Okay, how cool is that? 
okay, on a North Dakota, on a North Dakota sample. Actually, this one's, um, this one's Minnesota, forgive me, I think. Okay, so what did we gain from these efforts? What did we gain from these efforts? It's a tremendous amount of work to make these silly things. So in this one, we'll just have to cope with the images as we can. I don't know if we can turn the lights off, the big lights, or not, but if we can, that would be great. Um, so one of the things you can see, it's quite reddish brown, brownish red, um, and this is from a forest soil. It's a subsoil horizon. Um, quizzes on that in a little bit. Uh, you can see different class sizes uh, and various and sundry things like that. So what do we actually gain? We can see the waterways, and through image analysis, as I'll show you in a minute, we can actually quantify those. Um, this was just quickly done with a pen. Uh, we, can see the, we can see the channels, we can see the, the biopores, and here's an example of the biopore in the upper right. Under, uh, above the green, you can see all sorts of various and sundry plant materials. Some of it's been chewed up, some of it's been pooped out, and uh, so we know that, that carbon is being cycled up in that biopore of that particular one. Um, here's another one. This is from a, a Snellman soil out. Uh, that's the very same block that I showed you when I demonstrated the idea of uh, undisturbedness, right? And so here we have it, and so that's the thin section, not, as, not anywhere near as full as Mackenzie's, right? About half that maybe. Still a great thin section, and you can see quite a few things on it, okay? Now here's a close-up. I can see certain lithologies in there. I can see that, that, long, that long taper thing on the left is actually green. So that's a, a, it's a mineral that's loaded with iron and manganese and calcium, ferromagnesium. You can see a lot of dark spots in there as well. Those are iron uh, agglomerations, or they're not concretions, they're not that hard. They're iron masses that have formed in that E-horizon. But look at this scale, folks. This is a one, one, um, one millimeter scale. Now t remember, and this is a vertical image. So that one and a half inch rain that's gonna fall in this forest actually has to go, you know, through the upper layers of the litter and into the A horizon and into this E horizon. If it's one and a half inches of rain, how thick are those plates in that E horizon? Look at the one millimeter scale and think about that idea. Dr. Tom the other day was talking about those stinky gases. You can set up anaerobic conditions in this area because this controls water flow through the soil. When plants are growing actively, they can remove oxygen very, very quickly. And so this has really a strong aeration and hydraulic or hydrologic component to soil moisture movement and, and uh, edaphic conditions in the soil. So this is the E horizon. Okay, so this is a quiz. So what genetic horizons below the E horizon? Nobody took soils 210 from me. Okay, we'll get the answer in a minute. Okay, this is a polished thin section, and I had Braden, uh, Braden work with me, and, he, and we did as much polishing as we could, and this is probably one of the best thin section images you'll see this morning, is, the, um, is because it's kind of gray and white, and then we can use the petrographic microscope and spin the stage, and the, using the, the crossed polars, we can actually identify certain minerals. So I think you all can see that some of the minerals in here have completely parallel lines, like this one right, right sort of in the, in the center there. I, I can't, I, I hate these things. So, but the other point that you can see, there's a large void space there, that's 82 microns across, that's a fine sand grain, very fine sand grain. That's a very fine sand grain, getting close to the 50 micron limit of silt. So silt is what you feel on your hands when you make your biscuits and you feel the flour on your fingers, right? It's that fine. And that's that void size right there. But the th reason that I'm excited about this, of course, is that that golden pattern is actually this. But again, and this is a perfect, this is pretty much a perfect thin section for us as a result of good polishing and then sonication uh, to get rid of the grit. This is what you have in there when you, when you use uh, uh, bright lights under that very same thin section. And of course, the answer to the, to the question about what was below the E is, a, is the argillic horizon, the B, which you call the clay pan. And it's very important in our, in our soils to know whether you've got an argillic or not. But at any rate, the clasts are all covered. Clast is just the fancy name for the rock fragments. You notice all that gold pattern around it? It's really remarkable. Um, that's, um, that's, that's literally alluvial clay that is moved through soil genetic processes and accumulated around that feldspar clast. How do I know it's feldspar? Because if you guys look and you've got better eyes than I do, you can see that there's perfect 90 degree angles in that black, dark, gray clasp. You can see them very easily. Um, in this image above, 
you can see the same thing right up by the exclamation point in results. There's a small class that's tapered down to the, to the left, to the lower left, and see those lines in that one? That's also a feldspar. That's the kind of thing we can do with a petrographic scope, and it's really pretty remarkable. So this is a beautiful uh, thin section. So in addition to learning about pedology and soil genetic processes and things like that, we get these biological components, and it's just absolutely amazing what we can see. Now, this is a benefit of analysis. When I saw this from the, from the, the native pasture in, in, in Western Cass County, um, I was just blown away, and I sent it to Jama Moore over at the Electron Microscopy Lab. She's helped me many times try to identify things I see that I just don't know what they are. I know they're biological. She thinks this is the rachis from a grass. She thinks that go back to your go back to your biology. This is the literal rachis of the grass, and you can see 70 microns there. That's again um, a, the, the finest end of a very fine sand grain. Okay, so the gap between the between the rachis points would only allow a, a, a coarse silt particle to pass, or a, even a me, medium to fine silt could go back and forth between that, like a horse at a at a race. This oh sorry, this she identified as a gloom a gloom on, a, on, on the actual fragment. So again, it's a tremendous ability to see things that we would just never see before, uh, and it's really exciting. Uh, when, I, when I saw this one, and I'd seen fungal hyphae many a time, but I was very interested in this bluish one, and, um, and I had Kim come down to the lab, and, and uh, I, I, sent her, I sent her this image. And so here's, I just want to tell you what she said. Here's what she said. She said, Dr. Hopkins, yeah, what you're looking at looks like what I've been staring at for the past two months for Dr. Banerjee <laughs> as a result of that large, humongous project that they did. So she then sent me this picture of what she has noticed. Now, the shape at the head, mine looks more snake-like. These, of course, are in a corn root, and they're formed a little bit differently, but that's what we're looking at is, is vesicles of mycorrhizal fungi that's just sitting out here. This guy might as well have a, have a sign. I don't know where I'm going. But at any rate, that's pretty cool, another biological example. Um, and so here, here's another example. When I first saw this, I thought this might be some sort of a grub. Um, I wasn't sure. Uh, you know, it, it seemed certainly like it was biotic, but I wasn't sure what it was. This is an aggregates from a forest soil. Notice all of those, no, notice all the aggregates. The aggregates are all over the place in here. And, and, and the, this Frenchman wrote a paper back in the 90s or something like that, and he talks about functional domains in soils. And functional domains run through the whole scale of a soil, from your 80 acres to the pedon itself with all the horizons into the aggregate, whether it's whatever size. And here you can see, think about oxygen movement through this, okay, through this forest soil, a horizon. It's absolutely stunning. I think that something I want to share with you all for sure is this idea that Mentors were, we saw them, we saw them yesterday, we heard from them yesterday. They're mentioned a lot in this audience, okay? The Grazing Lands Coalition is an example of one. Well, mine, one of my mentors is the Vimy Conference, which is virtual micromorphology. They're held about every year in um, Europe. And so I've actually shown some of my North Dakota soil slides to these people and said, what is this? So Hans Huisman, this amazing Belgian, said, Dutchman, he's a Dutchman. He says, oh, he says, that looks like a nut seed. That looks like a nut seed to me. And then, and then later I wrote back to one of his other colleagues and she said, oh, actually, she said, that's a hawthorn shell. That's the seed from a hawthorn. This comes from the forest by Rochert, Minnesota, by Tamarack National Wildlife Refuge, and there's hawthorn in the, there's hawthorn in the woods. You know, you watch out for the thorns. That's a hawthorn shell that you're looking at right there. Now, is it surprising to find biological material in soil? Of course it's not. But think about how do you get the 10-year-old, the 15-year-old, the 55-year-old to go beyond their understanding of soil and just think a little bit more about the beauty and the amazement of what's lying underneath it. As Dr. Banerjee said, it's the most complex ecosystem possibly on the earth. I think it is. So that's pretty cool. Um, this is a mineralogical uh, uh, picture taken under, taken under cross polars on, on my scope. And so what you're doing here is, is uh, by having high light intensity and, and turning the stage under cross polars, you can actually see different birefringence patterns, which we can then use to identify minerals so we can know whether it's a, a quartz or a feldspar or a biotite or an amphibole. And here you can see biotite just going, look at me. 
It's really cool, and that's all that bright rainbow color that you see, and I think that what, what we're looking at in the, um, some of the more mm, caramel, deep, 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 rich caramel colors are actually are weathered biotite, so they're covered with a, a coating, a veneer, a, a sheet, a shroud of iron oxides that are, um, mm, uh, that are developed over time. This stuff does not happen in weeks. It happens in hundreds of years and thousands of years. Um, why is it important for us? Because that plant wants potassium, that plant wants manganese, and that plant wants uh, iron. And so it's nice to be able to identify some of these minerals that we have. Um, so those are just some general examples of what we can get from looking at the thin sections somewhat aesthetically, but you can certainly pull more out of it. Um, the year that I got the, the federal surplus lot 86 from Lincoln, <laughs> thank you, Wade, uh, in the field course, we were up on Lynn Carlson's farm in Steele County, and there's Maria's finger, and she's, this, this pad came from a depth, this de came from a depth no more than where this finger is. This came from three inches down in the soil, three to four, no more than that, on a cropped field. And if you know soils, you can see every single genetic horizon that's in the prairie profile here. It's a little faint but it's there. And that's when I started thinking, hmm, wait a minute. I think I know what I might be able to use that machine for. And so we've got calcic material in here. We've got cambic BW horizon material that's more brownish because of those iron oxides. And there's crumbs of the famous Moloch epipedon, the mollusols, the, the black earths of the, of the Dakota prairies. I, I gave up on, um, I gave up on, um, on, on Maria's ped and I went to, I, yeah, so this idea then came to me. This was a tochthenus. I like the word. I, I, I learned it when I first started teaching 210. This is what it said on the, le, on the web yesterday, because I'm getting older. It says, sprung from the land itself. And I thought, no. I said, because I got it from the guy that taught Greek and Latin at NDSU. And he said, no. He said, it sprung from the very earth itself. That's the classical Greek for the word autochthonous. Now, how cool is that? literally sprung from the very earth itself. And that was sort of the idea about this. So Leanne's image from uh, the Gerald Wildlife Area in, um, in Minnesota shows this a little bit better. You can see the boundary of the calcic horizon, which of course is loaded with calcium carbonate, genetic horizon, takes thousands of years to form. And above that, you can see a sharp, abrupt boundary with mollic crumbs. They're black. And you can also see, I don't know if this is supposed to be the light. Yeah, okay, now I'm using a light. Ignore me, folks. Uh, I'm using a light to point out some beautiful browns in here. The brown, the brown granules are that cambic horizon, which is typically in a prairie soil would be in a depth like this, where my hand is. That's where it would be on, on our typical soils. Um, and so this is a nice model for like, why are we doing this micromorphology? Because I want to get at colors and I want to get at quantification of how much change has gone on there. And so this story of the barns degraded, as you will, is based on the distribution of our barns benchmark soil, which is about 2.15 million hectares in North Dakota. There's its distribution. And so <clears throat> I'm going to show some slides that are based on this barn soil health story that uh, Dr. Meyer Bond did with me back in 2014 to 2017. And then also some reference sites on native barns, which are run the, basically the north-south range of the barns profile in uh, other barn series in North Dakota. And then there's one or two pictures I'll share from the NRCS ARS study right across the river over here um, in, in the long-term pasture that's, um, that's at, the, uh, at the ARS station, which is really cool. Okay, so let's take a look at this for just a second. Um, this is one of Meyer's sites, it's 2A10, that's Ross out there digging. Looks pretty good, right? So we're gonna come back to that in just a minute. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hide Ross. We're gonna think about some other classic information about the barn's soil. This is characterization data that the NRCS took um, before 1960. And do you remember what Dr. Banerjee said? That coming to this state, one of the things he realized was that there was this incredibly rich characterization database for soil properties in the state. North Dakota is pretty unique in terms of soil survey data. Um, and so <clears throat> here we can see the average for all the barns A horizons, and we had about 55 to use, and then we sort of slimmed that down based on the true ideas of what a barn soil should be, and we ended up with about 32. The soil organic carbon is 2.76%, that's remarkable. Soil organic matter is almost five, 
that perfect 5% in the circle of soils that you see, and then the calcium carbonate equivalent is less than a half a percent, okay? And that's undoubtedly from plowing, undoubtedly from the mixing across the land, even before 1960, uh, of the calcium carbonate, or biological movement, bioturbation, and the pH is 6.47, which is exactly perfect for all mineral nutrition that you learn about from Brady and Weil and from all your introductory soils texts. Whether you're in Switzerland, whether you're in Indiana, or whether you're in, 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 in Vietnam, it doesn't matter. CEC, the CEC, forgive me, the CEC is, um, sorry, CEC is almost 25. The, the cation exchange capacity is almost 25. And, and, and there are many farmers in here, certainly Rocky yesterday, who talked about his marginal soils. You could sense that he was talking about coarse textured soils to some degree. Rocky helped me out with that. But, you know, he would love to have, you know, that uh, quarter section with a CEC of 25, I, I assure you. It's just the nature of what the barn soil is like. It's incredibly productive. So I started looking at barns very carefully. I thought that this plot that I'm using as a background was from Dr. Lau's group, but it's not. It's out of Donegan's work. He worked with another famous group out of North, uh, forgive me, Fort Collins, Colorado, um, the Northern, Northern uh, you know, Great Plains uh, Ecology Laboratory. And they, they tracked soil organic carbon uh, from 1910 to 2020. And you can see in that pattern of, 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 of change, of course, we've dropped as a result of plowing the prairie. Um, about 53%, they said, of, of 2000, 19, 1907 levels down in this period around 1950, 1960. And then a slow increase, this is modeled data in the Corn Belt, uh, uh, increase as a result of um, uh, conservation tillage and various and sundry good management techniques. Remember, Dr. Lal used the expression judicious management in his talk yesterday. I thought that was really cool. So what we've done here, there's some, other, so I, I've put some of these barn soils in, in context. And so there were two pre-60s that we've got in here. One's this triangle right here. And the other one, sorry, it's just hard for me to see, is this triangle down here. This is by Cavalier County. There's a little more shale in that landscape than there is in the other one. Um, and, uh, and you can see where that would have fit on these ideas of really, really high quality soil organic carbon levels. Then we went back to um, about eight sites where the, the soils had been taken pre-60 and we sampled them again. So we learned some interesting things. Of course, we knew we would have some changes. We had two sort of, one, this is a CRP site that was actually higher than the original. That, that's Dickey County one, okay? And that was a pasture up there. And then, um, and then Steel County is more typical. The, the black square that you can see, folks, right here, and the black square. That's the diminution, that's the loss of organic carbon on that particular landscape. And Brandon felt he was probably accurate to about three meters, okay? So, so I'm more accurate than the edge of your table in terms of where we've gone back to try to catch that, mm, that pre-1960s hole in the ground. One of the sites, a stinking road had been changed around the area, so we lost it, we didn't get to get it. Um, another one here, let's take a look at this green site. This is Walsh County 2, and Walsh County 2 is down here now. Those are significant drops in the quality of that soil. Um, and, and, and then Brennan and I, this was Brennan's first hole in the ground. We don't have chemistry data for it, but that's where the, um, the one at the Buffalo Alice Exchange was. That when it was mapped and, and described by, mm, forgive me, when it was described by, uh, 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 he went on to PhDs, Redmond, when it was described by Redmond, the BK horizon was about here and the surface was here. This is where the calcium carbonate started. Calcium carbonate in our soil with Brandon in 2012 was about 10% in the A horizon. We didn't even call it an A horizon. I called it a B, P, W, K. K for calcium carbonate. W for it should have been a cambic, but its pH was way too high, and its calcium carbonate level was way too high. So it's pretty crazy stuff. So enough of that. Let's go back to Ross. Ross is digging. Everything looks good. Well, this is what that nice dark soil looked like. Okay, and you're, we're missing the very upper part of it a little bit here in this image that, that Meyer took. But you can see it's laden with calcium carbonate. Of course, it's easy to see. We can see the contact here. I've got another quick image. So as we zoom in on that, when you dig a lot of holes out in this country, you get to know about the difference in the transitions from an A horizon to a B horizon, from a B horizon to the second B horizon below it. You get a sense of what that is. This stuff that we're looking at right here, folks, is 
is upper B horizon, BK horizon material, but it's still got some of the, some of the threads of color from the, B, the cambic above it, which is completely different color, completely different um, uh, pH, uh, totally different. Okay, so there's the pHs for that soil. And what did it look like when, uh, what did it look like when, when Ross was digging from a distance in the first landscape shot? It looked like I'd take a quarter section of that land in a heartbeat. Well, not with 10% calcium carbonate in the surface, this affecting micronutrient nutrition, not with 13% in the upper A, and certainly not with 40%, and all that's, all that's in, a, in less than a foot. So the entire cambic horizon is gone. It's gone like snow on the water. It's been lost as a result of tillage erosion. There's no question. And then mixing, and that process of mixing allows that nice black soil. Remember, the Russians called them the Chernozems, black earths. It's a strong pigment, and so it can, it can color stuff a lot. Dr. Franzen said, so my point is, is of course, you've lost an entire genetic horizon as a result of this. So, um, so we wanna, I want to use micromorphology to try to capture some of that. And as Dr. Franzen said here, when you're on the tractor seat, it all looks dark. That was his very expression. It all looks, it all looks dark. So it's all okay, but it's not all okay. And you guys can think a little bit about that in terms of knowing where you've come through in your management programs uh, in terms of soil health, such and so. So this points out the need for native Barnes pedons as reference pedons that we can get some micromorphology for. So I got, the first one was down at Brad Sands Ranch, down by Ellendale. I got to get out there in 2018. They dug a pit for me for a range tour. It was really cool. And when the range scientists got out on this pasture where the pit wasn't, they, we were agog. You could feel the sod, never been plowed. You could feel the sod underneath your feet, and it hadn't rained. It was that mellow. The bulk density was that light in terms of its quality. Um, so this was reference site one on, on Brad's ranch. And Brad, of course, got that um, North Dakota... North Dakota um, uh, Conservation Award, which is so wonderful back in 2021, uh, the Aldo Leopold Award for the entire state. Um, range scientists, I want to just tell you, they were walking, they left the trailer lickety split and were looking at side oats grandma and they were looking at all the various and sundry properties uh, uh, and examples of, the, of what was the native prairie components. And of course, was there Kentucky bluegrass here? Yes, there was. Some. This was site two up on the Paul Overby farm. Uh, my wife's out there helping me. I'm trying to set out a transect to get the best uh, example that I can of the, uh, um, of the soil. And Paul grew up on this land, and he said he, that there was never a tractor on it. The last one was really fun. I think it, it was a very special day. I was just blessed to be out there. This is on the Arrowwood National Wildlife Refuge. They do, this has never been plowed. It's up on a high bench. I had to haul all my materials up from a pretty stinking steep slope from the truck down on the trail below. And uh, it was a gorgeous day. Um, they use fire every five or seven years. So this was really, really remarkable. Okay, so that's where those sites are located. These are the tools of the trade, okay? Uh, my shovels, the, the materials to bring these samples back, the, the, the bagged samples that were the lab dirt that I started this thing with, and there's the fingernail polish that we use to mark all these peds up with the world. Because I, I don't want to bring that ped back like this or like this. I want up with the world so that when I do the slicing and the cutting and getting at undisturbedness, I know which way is up. Right? It's really cool. And um, uh, we, we found that this particular fingernail polish worked really great, but my wife wasn't interested. Everybody in here over 50 ought to know what that tool is. <laughs> okay. Okay, so image analysis. Let's look at a couple of examples in here. Um, and uh, and <laughs> the first one we'll look at is car calcium carbonate distributions, because again, you want that carbonate deep. You don't want it in your plow. You don't want it in your plow. You don't want it in your disc. You don't want it anywhere near where that crop is growing. Um, and so let's take a look at that. So here's a, here's a thin section from the Barn Soil Health site that was in cast through Stutzman County. We went two townships north and south of I-94 for the 181 samples. So here you can see a sample that's taken from 15 to 20 centimeters. That's here, right? Now let's think about that depth and what that means, and you can see it's laden with calcium carbonate. These are, the, these are the light buff colors. There's the cambic colors, and now I think that you guys, there's the light on me, so it's just hard for me to see you all. Um, there's a, you can see these beautiful golds. This is a worm channel in here, and the worm has incorporated both some of the darker cambic material, 
and a lot of the rest of the cambic material, and there's crumbs of calcic material in this worm channel as well. So what, uh, what, uh, what uh, one of the members of this audience did was set up a couple different uh, ROIs, regions of interest, and we used those to train the software to look at the colors that we were going to identify as calcic. And then the, this, that was all applied, those three, on number three down there. So we trained the system to get at the colors. And so these are the calcic zones in coral that come from the, um, of course, it's a modic scan that we're using. And so, you know, the first thing that Sean did was he took out the out-of-focus zones. It just comes with the territory. So that's going to be eliminated. The large clasts are eliminated. And then he get, has to go into some separate steps to, to remove the really smaller clasts. And he left me with a concept that says, and then with some clever tricks, you can remove the smaller clasts. And he didn't completely fill me in on what those tricks were, but no. Uh, so the total area is 3 million microns squared. The numbers are nuts. The numbers are nuts. Uh, 3 million microns squared. It's amazing what this software can do. And the calcic area is about almost 300,000 meters squared, forgive me, micron squared. So the calcic load, visually, is about 9.56%. The calcic load is about 9.56%. Just call it 9, call it 9.5, call it 10. That's what it, that's what it is, basically. This was some of our first modeling. What Meyer did at that site, and I was with him at that site, because of course I was sampling my morphology. In that very site, he measured, of course, A horizon, AP, and BK horizon material. You got carbon. Notice the carbon level, the soil organic carbon is 1.8. Notice the next horizon down in the BK, it's 0.36. Think about some of the carbon numbers that we've talked about in the, in the day yesterday. Um, and you can see that again. Uh, quick, 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 quick. Soil organic matter 3.1 and 0 0.6, same sort of number. Uh, and then calcium carbonate equivalent is 6.4 in the AP, and it's 15.8 in the BK. And I will be very happy to accept 10% from image analysis to say that's a pretty good proxy for the amount of calcium carbonate in that soil, which helps me interpret what that soil health is like for that particular piece of ground out there in the, in the world. So I think, again, this idea of the proxy works pretty well. Okay. So another one, another one we'll look at is total porosity estimates. Um, this is another one of uh, Meyer's sites. This is an APBW. And again, these are all cropped sites. So every time, just about, unless we had a landscape situation that was allowing uh, a thicker A, we would have sort of some mixed colors in that A. Not always, but this is an APBW from about 10.5. So now we've got my fist, this soil surface, and now I'm right at this finger. That's where this, that's where this ped was taken, where it was turned into the concept of undisturbedness, where it was sliced on the tile saw, glued onto a plate glass with a resin that is now available after two years, and you've got the scanned image here. So what, um, what Shahid did for me here, and he comes out of engineering, so you've got to have a special mindset to do this. Um, you really do, and uh, he, was, he was great. Uh, and so because there's so many pixels in these, you have to do slabs. You can't do the whole thin section at once. It, it would just choke the computers. I'll demonstrate in a second. So we're going to look at this upper one, OK? This is the upper slab. And there's the border of the upper slab. And let's look, at, let's look carefully for just a moment. And the five millimeter scale is pretty big. Let's look at that upper um, red box. This is what it looks like in real life. Now we're looking at the pixels that, mo the, that, that the Image Pro software is actually seeing from a, a kind of, as it were, sort of a rectified TIFF image. And you can see there's a lot of variability in there between the tiny little pixels that we have. So I think you all can appreciate. It gets pretty hard to do visual estimation of like, where are these boundaries that I want to say, this is pretty uniform. This is not so uniform. And I, I think you can, you can appreciate that. So the boundary of the green is shown very clearly here. And then some void spaces and uh, obviously darker, darker colors associated with the cambic horizon. OK, so the reality of making selections in this software is, is a little problematic because you don't want to choke the computer with the calculations that it's doing. It's pretty crazy. It's an amazing thing. There's the first, there's the first slab up there. It had a void percentage of about 30.5% in that one slab that you just saw that I gave the example. Here's the whole range of all five of them. And you can see, actually, this is reasonably tight. I'm not a numeric person. 
Okay, my father was an electrical engineer. He did not give me one LL of mathematical knowledge. You know, he, he gave me the Hopkins sweating gene. And that, thanks, Pop. At any rate, so, but, you know, so the standard deviation is about five, and the mean is 30. So 5% difference on porosity for a whole section of soil. Again, it's a thin piece of soil, but that layer... We can make some assumptions about that, what that is. Um, the lowest strip now is, has been stained blue to sort of help you visualize this micromorphology. And this is a horizontal, this is, by the way, this is a horizontal piece, okay? We'll, we'll have both vertical images you'll look at and we'll have horizontal images you're looking at, right? Now picture the rain moving through that system going through those blue zones. That's a pretty cool way of thinking about what, what's happening in terms, of, um, in terms of processes, soil function, soil function. And water movement and hydrology are huge. I loved Zach's image of the fence line contrast between where he did that management profile. And we've got lots of pictures similar to that from North Dakota. But you could see the ponding over on the other side. Talk to Gene Govan. You guys that are doing good work with your range management know that there's an effect on hydrology, which is so cool. Okay, so the micromorphological proxy, proxy for soil porosity is basically there. We can start working with it and actually get more work done. So, so now I'd just like to share with you um, some, some ideas of, forgive me, of, of educational opportunities. Um, and, and, and this is, you know, this isn't for, you know, Soils 210. This is for the societal idea. This is for that first column that Dr. Lal put up about societal ideas of soil, soil, soil quality, soil health, of the soil resource itself. This is for everybody. Um, and so here we've got one of the, um, uh, one of the reference sites. This is Sands, uh, down on Brad Sands Ranch. And this is taken, folks, this is taken at 60 centimeters. My finger, right here on top of this thing, 60, now yeah, maybe, there we go, a little closer. I'm accurate to within two centimeters, right? You with me? That's a horizontal sec. This is a vertical section. Now picture the rain moving, and where's that rain going to go? Where's that infiltration water going to go? Well, it's got a multitude of pore spaces to move through. And you can see the worm castings. You can see the biological import of these voids that are biopores that are full of various and sundry um, uh, uh, evidence of life, evidence of life from the earliest stages to literally death, as it were. Um, and so here we go. Now, we've, now we're looking at the horizontal Literally at 49, uh, literally at, um, sorry, at 59 centimeters of depth. And this is, this is a remarkable amount of porosity, and it's a remarkable amount of biological material in the pores. We don't see that in the crop thin sections. You see some, but you don't see anything like this. You don't see anything like this. It's remarkable. So this is a modic scan of this uh, particular BK horizon. Um, again, I think this is on Brad's ranch. Um, we're going to look at this red ROI down there. The little tiny scale bar you can see is about uh, less, than a, um, uh, less than a millimeter. And we're going to take a look at that. Oh, I've got to do it this way. Okay, so now, this is hard to see, I realize that, but so the void space is shown in this light purple, and you can see that the, the um, actual uh, spaces, these biopores have been picked out, and we used a very simple way of separating the amount of material in a biopore, um, because this was some of our first uh, work on this idea of trying to characterize what's the biological activity in the actual pores that are in the soil as a result of worms and natural processes of expansion, contraction, and blah, blah, blah. Pretty cool, okay? So this is what the results showed, that there were about a total of about uh, uh, some five, five million uh, micron squared of biopores in that ROI, about 8.53% of the total. And there you can see the breakdown of the types of low activity biopores, medium activity biopores, and high activity biopores, about 5%. That's pretty cool. That's quantification, okay? Uh, which is really pretty neat. We can do this and start replicating it. Okay, right across the river over here, this young woman was sampling soils and she's got a smile on her face that won't quit. Of course she did. She's on field S66, which is this long-term great... I, I was amazed when I learned this. All you ARS scientists, I was stunned when I found out that this was the second oldest stocking rate experiment in North America. I was stunned. 
It's an incredible treasure for all of us North Dakotans and, and really for the really for the nation. So this is part of the NRCS ARS Dynamic Soil Properties Study uh, w w that we're looking at different types of uh, management. And this, of course, was the native system. And so we're going to look at some pictures from field um, S66. Anyway, um, it's a wonderful image. It's a wonderful, wonderful image. So talk about biology. Talk about biology. There's the, there's the mite excrement filling this bit of plant material, and the whole bit of the plant material, whatever it is, whatever chunk of root or material it was, has been consumed. I'm sure that the mites have a, a, a tendency to be a little bit picky, like I am, about what I want to eat. And so they've, they've, as it were, sort of, ah, sorry, they've hollowed it out. Uh, but everywhere else you look in there, there's tons of roots, there's, uh, there's biopores everywhere. It's absolutely stunning. So this is what the mite poop looks like. And we've got these, this was, in, this was from a soil health side. I called it the, the mite poop in the bear fur. I couldn't, I, I, and looking at the close-up of the soybeans the other day from Sam Markell's lecture back at college, I thought, is my, is my bear fur a little piece of the pod of a soybean with the follicle, with the little hairs? I don't have a clue. So I'm no biologist and I'm certainly no chemist, but anybody's got suggestions, uh, give me a howl. I think it'd be nice to know, but this shows you what my, my poop looks like. So not only did we find the poop, we found the pooper in our thin sections. And we found this a couple times. And this is what Jerry had to say. I sent this to him just the other day, but I had long, long believed it was possibly mesofauna. And this is what Jerry said. Jerry is a taxonomy, uh, he's in the, in the entomology department, he's a taxonomist, a world-class taxonomist, frankly, to be honest with you, and he said, that being said, the oval item strikes me as a mite, traditionally class arachnida, and order acari. So bingo, I've got the poop, I've got the pooper, the whole point is carbon cycling within the system. It's just amazing. So, so how do you use that with a 10-year-old, or 20-year-old, or a 55-year-old? who's interested in soils. How do you use it? You can use it in many, many ways. This is from that same field. This is a little hard to see, and I forgive you because I don't, forgive me because I don't have a blow up of this, but you see this rounded body right here with this long tail, a little bit like a comet, but way more detailed. Folks, this, and, and Dr. Zitnik has also uh, confirmed this, this is a pollen tube. We've found pollen grains before. This is a pollen tube undergoing asexual reproduction. That's what's called a pollen tube coming away from that literal circular body right here, folks. And we've seen several of these features in the S66, um, in the S66 uh, zone. But look at all the, root, all the root pieces. This is a horizontal. So again, you're looking down. You're, you know, picture oxygen moving down with a vapor. Picture water moving down. Picture a worm burrowing down. This is what you see. This is your neighborhood. It's just astounding. Um, Educational applications, mineralogy, absolutely, absolutely. So this, let's see, ah, mm, maybe. Are you going to do anything or not? Ah, this is a short video. It's just 30 seconds. So there's a thin section. It's very, very fine-grained, but we had this monstrous clast in it, this big chunk. Notice how, the, notice how the feldspar grain is showing different colors as I rotate the stage under cross polars. So that's a cool way of getting at mineralogy differences once you're, you know, and I'm not a trained mineralogist by any means, but I am a pathologist and I know how important this is. It's really cool and we can do so much in mineralogy. Um, this is a, a, all of the ferromagnesians when, when we've got them as class show kind of a green from a peridot to a really dark, rich green, uh, almost emerald sometimes, and, and, and amphiboles have a cleavage of 56 degrees. I can just see that from looking in the scope, even with my poor eyes, I can see that cleavage, I can measure it, and that, you know, that's just of course drawn with a PowerPoint, but that's probably accurate to within one or two percent. That's the cleavage of an amphibole, calcium, magnesium, and iron, okay? Through weathering, that's how they get into the system. That's how they get into the soil solution with the help of microbes generating organic acids. And so that's how things happen. This is one from over by um, Malacca in, in, uh, in, in Minnesota. I wanted to sample what we would call a, a red superior lobe till. And I call this, this slide broke. See this? This kind of stuff happens. It's so frustrating, but it does happen because there's a lot of work in that. So the amphibole dumbbell looks like this. And there's those little 56 degree cleavage marks. And you can see everywhere that there's a little cleavage mark like this, there's a little band of iron coming away. 
How cool is that? How stinking cool is that? You're looking at weathering in action on the superior lobe till, which has been sitting in, you know, north of St. Cloud for thousands of years, right? And this is a, this is a cropped soil, but nevertheless, that's the amphibole dumbbell. Uh, pretty neat. Now, um, now, lately, I've got some new data um, that is electron uh, energy dispersive spectroscopy that, that Scott Payne has helped me with at the electron microscopy lab. And I wanted to see about what I could learn through literally electron, electron <laughs> spectroscopy. And so we're literally shooting electron beams into this soil to see what we can learn. So there's a big class right here that's sort of irregular shaped. You'll see this in a second. But I was interested in this one. So the ROI that's in the, um, in the aqua color, that's one of these amphiboles or it's a horn blend or it's some kind of a, fer uh, a ferromagnesian mineral, and I was interested in what that looked like. Here's what it looks like. That's, the, that's electron microscopy space. We get these black and whites, and it's like, it's impossible sometimes to see where you are, but this is the clast right here. You can see some lines in it, and that points that out. This is that weird sandstone clast. See that shape that I'm trying to show right here, folks? I realize this is a horrible little pointer right up there. That's that sandstone class. So that's what the electron uh, it camera takes, you know, and then it does the actual imaging on that little square inside of it, and this is the result. So we can pull out the elemental ideas of what we're looking at. 2% manganese, you, uh, ma magnesium, forgive me, you don't get any, that, anything like that in the soil matrix. You don't get anything like that. Ma it'll come in at like 0.3 and 0.2. Right? Here's 2.2%, 2.02. Calcium, of course, is, is strong, and there's your iron, and that's what these mineral types are named for, and that's why they're important. Um, here's another one that's of much more interest to you all, because you're kind of going, this seems like kind of a strange line of work. Well, I'll admit that, but I can still do it for a little while. Uh, and so here we're looking again at a calcic horizon. That we're way down at 60 centimeters again, something like this, okay? 60, 60 is more than a half a meter. There's a meter, uh-huh. So we're down this far from the soil surface, okay, in the BK horizon, and we're very interested, of course, in the idea of the production of iron through a weathering process. It helps us understand chemistry. It helps us understand age in soils. It's tremendous. So we have two ROIs in here, and of course, I'm betting that the calcium content is going to be higher in that light buff gray. This is what electron microscopy space looks like. It, it, can you imagine how hard it was to go through 99 acquisitions and try to pin exactly where they came from based on these images? We've learned a couple things uh, as a result of that. Um, I'm going to just share this with you really quick. You notice this zone up here that's got a little tongue or a groove or a bay, and then it kind of comes out like a weird nose right there? That's this one. That's this one right here. There's the weird nose. Okay. And so there's our two ROIs, and that's the results from the two ROIs, seven and eight. And there you can see, if you look carefully, of course, that iron is 5.2% in one, and it's 1.9% in the other. Calcium is 5.5% in one, and it's um, a 1.25 in the other. Okay? So this is actually working for us to help understand this accumulation of iron oxides, iron oxide, hydroxides actually, FeOOH, and it's an important pedogenic indicator. Uh, it really is in terms of soil, soil processes and soil development. So it's, it's a good way to think about it. Um, I want to share this one with you too, just we'll, we'll only be with iron for another moment. The reddish zone shows one class that's pretty unique. This is what, this is what um, uh, uh, wonderful Emily did with really good polishing over in the geoscience department. And this, this is a gorgeous image. This could stink and be in a book. And I want to concentrate. This, this material that you can see, these zones, these are olivine. The simple, simple iron magnesium silicate. And you know, if you take a mineralogy class, it's one of the first ones you learn. And so I want to, but this is why I want you to see it. Now there's, can you see the threads? Can you see the threads going from the boundary of this clast up to the olivine itself? It's like it's bleeding out to the outer zones of that, of that, of that, of that void space. It's soil genesis in action. It's, it's, this, is, this is real live pedology on the, going on. So let me finish with just a few slides for the young of any chronological age who value this resource that we all depend upon. Uh, and, and I think it's just... 
It's amazing. Matt did some extra polishing on this one root feature. Andre, I definitely want to talk to you about this afterwards. <laughs> it, and he named it the Kraken, you know? It's like, whoa, what in the world is going on here? I think this is from, I think that's from the Overby, uh, the Overby farm. And, and, and Paul said, God, it looks like it's from outer space. Oh, this is the one. This is another pollen grain undergoing a asexual reproduction. These are cells from that pollen grain moving off to the, off to the um, everybody on this side too. Um, the, the horrible useless pointer is showing you right here that I can, I've got cells that are tied to that. I talked to a woman in Iowa who did her PhD with a micromorphologist who taught rediscovering soil micromorphology down at St. Louis a month or two ago. She said, I looked at hundreds of, of pollen grains. She said, I've never seen one cut in half right down the middle. And then it was identified again by this uh, emeritus professor from Iowa State, a palynologist, and he said, it's unquestionably circium, unquestionably circium. And we, when we sampled, the bull thistle from the floor was this tall, and I was slashing that stuff left, right, and the center with my, um, with my, <laughs> with my uh, spade. Matt named this one, area of interest with unidentified creature. Okay, this is from um, sand, the Sand Ranch. Okay, um, at, mm, it's, it's an A horizon. Look at the porosity, people. Think about Lavelle's concept of soil function, soil functional domains, soil functional domains, and that's what we've got. Look what Matt found. Look what Matt found. Okay, and those of you that know more about, well, a whole lot of small biology, please talk to me more about this. One of the plant pathologists said, <laughs> well, it, regardless, these I think are called acrotarchs, and they say if you look on the web, that acrotarchs are the first primary producers in the ancient water columns of this planet. The first things that actually were able to utilize <laughs> solar radiation and form, form, uh, form material. And it, I've never seen anything like it, and it said that they disappear from the fossil record in the early Carboniferous. And I was always babbling to students about, oh, there's all those Jurassic sands, limestones that are coming down from Canada that help make our till productive, you know? And there is a lot of limestone and dolomite in Canada. Um, sorry, they disappear. They disappear from the fossil record in the early Carboniferous. So I don't know if this is a fossil that just was part of the litholic, litho lithologic material in that thin section, and it's just sort of say, hey, look at me. I don't know, but it's pretty cool. And then lastly, this one uh, from the Overbee Farm. Um, those are fine root hairs, and there's a 20 micron. This is fine silt. This is where we go from fine silt to clay, which is two, two, you know, two, two thousandths of, of a millimeter in size. And uh, so 50, 20 to 50 mic, 20 to tw um, two microns to 20 microns is what we call uh, fine silt. That's what we have in lust. Sorry. And, um, and look at the fine root hairs coming off that, folks. It's astounding. Okay, I got to go. Um, I've never seen these things in the cropped. I've never seen these things in cropped systems. Never, in the thin sections. So I'll leave you with Kubiena's beautiful quote and the picture of the dirt bag, <laughs> the lab dirt at the beginning. It's a wonderful quote. It's a wonderful quote. And I think, I think it's just so cool. Um, thanks to the various and sundry folks, largely NRCS, equipment funds from, from, from my own school and the College of Agriculture um, for help to get, this, to get this thing going. It's been great. Matt, you've seen his Kraken, uh, is still in the lab with me. Shahid did some of this really remarkable, um, uh, elect, uh, forgive me, image analysis work. And Meyer Bond, who, who got his master's here with me. Uh, and Ben Shurek is working with me right now also. So I really thank these students who have who, who, been so helpful all along. Okay, okay, now here's the last question. Do you get the joke? It's the only one. <laughs> Thank you all.